November of 2008, I had 100% of my customers cancel their contracts. And I was, I rolled a zero. Have you ever rolled a zero? Like I was in several years into my business at this point, and all of a sudden revenue went to zero. And you know, what do you do when that happens? Well, I, the first thing that I did is I did have to tell everybody, hey, you know, we're rolling to zero this month. The financial crisis hit, it's outside of our control. And I think the first key for me is don't blame somebody else for something that's completely outside of everyone's control. It wasn't that somebody on my team didn't try hard enough or that the quality of our work wasn't good enough. This was an external you know, threat and um, you know, we had to handle it as a team. So the, the first thing I did is I was extremely candid. Now, some people did panic, but ironically, them leaving and going and finding another job sort of helped us solve some of our expense issues at a time when we couldn't be fully employed. So for me, that wasn't such a bad thing. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today, we're gonna to talk about leading in a crisis. And what does it really take to show up powerfully when the stakes are high, when the shits hit the fan, if you will, and you have got to align people back together. Well, we have a special guest today. He is the CEO and founder of Motive. Uh, they are a CX company, uh, customer experience, if you don't know what that means. Uh, David G. Ewing and I talk about leading in a crisis. What really is interesting about this conversation is it isn't what you would normally hear about this. It is talking about um, his principles of leadership, the things he's learned, the things, how he's used that as his company's grown really fast and how that aligns employees to the point of actually getting the kind of output um, that he was looking for from his team. So a lot of pack in, inside this conversation. So I really hope you lean into it. My name is Gene Hammett. I'm an executive coach. We do leadership coaching. We do manager coaching and we do cultural transformations inside of fast growth companies. That's what we're known for. We work with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Inc. 5,000 level companies and others that are growing really fast. And so if you think we can help you, I'd love for you to reach out. Uh, just go to forelevation.com. That's our company business. My website is genehammett.com. And that's where you find the, the podcast is on genehammett.com. And if you have any questions, make sure you reach out. Happy to help you. Um, now here's the interview with David G. Ewing. David, how are you? Well, I'm a little beat up, Gene, but otherwise I'm all right. Ready to rock. I know you just went through an ultra uh, race. It was a team race, though. Give us one insight that you weren't aware going into this ultra 24-hour race. You know, it's really the idea that doing hard things leads to you doing more hard things. And when you do them as a team, it matters so much more than when you do it as an individual. So my shift was because uh, it was a team race. I had 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. because I said, I'll just take the worst time. And first off, it was amazing. There wasn't a puff of wind in the sky and the stars were out. It was great. But, um, you know, when we came together at the end, it was from 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. Everybody was in tears. Everybody was excited. It was wonderful. And you did this with your employees and team? No, I actually did this through Entrepreneurs Organization. Mm -hmm. And I did it with my forum, which is a group of eight people that I meet with once a month. And we talk about our heaviest problems in personal life, family, and business and, how, and you know, talk about how to clear them. And, um, and so we just did this as a, as a way to provide unity and, uh, and a bunch of other forums joined us. So we had multiple forums there. It was really great. We called it the Iron Forums of Texas. Fantastic. Well, I will dive into what I normally do is just jump into, tell us about your company. So Motive, what do you guys do and, and what are you up to? Yeah. So we believe that the best customer experience wins, right? And so to me, customer experience is everything that happens from the very first moment you hear about a company to the very last transaction you ever do with them. And it's all things in between. What we found though, is that it's a lot more than just, I want to smile brighter and try harder. It's, it's really the discipline to have the systems and to have the processes in place to make sure you can do that. And so that, that's what we do. And as a result, you know, our lifetime value goes up with each customer. And that, that's the game, main game plan. Love it. David, you came here not to talk about the business side of it, but really the leadership that drives success in your organization from a, just one part of that is you've made the ink list multiple times. Uh, tell us a little bit about your style of leadership or principle of leadership that drives you to success. You know, I have found that there is many different types of leadership as there are grains of sand on the beach, right? And so for me, um, what really works is I have um, tried to be able to be flexible and 
as much as possible, be a visionary leader. And to me, I've never been satisfied with, with when people say that, right? Like you're a visionary leader and they usually have like one sentence, like, you know, restaurants that are the same everywhere, that's McDonald's. And then you're like, that, that's not a vision. That's just like one sentence. And so I don't know about you, but I feel like vision needs to be a lot more than that. I, I don't think vision is one sentence. Um, when I put together vision, it's, you know, it's maybe 10 or 15 pages of like, what are we going to look like in the future? And so that everybody can truly see it, right? Not one sentence, but maybe a lot. And then how do you explain and have everybody see it? That to me is what vision is. And so I really spend a lot of time on that. But as you know, things can go wrong, right? <laughs> and so when that happens, you have to be a kind of a crisis leader as well. And that's that's really kind of the more interesting half for me. I, I do want to talk about the crisis and, and how you do that. But the vision thing, I, I don't do 15 pages, but I recommend my clients do between three to five. Because the one line or the one like little executive summary doesn't have much of an emotional connection to it. Whereas a longer vision that breaks up the company in parts, and, and I've got a framework for this. Um, how is that longer version of your vision able to be used inside building the team that you want, the culture that you want? Well, the, the reason it's longer for me is because uh, any one person, I don't expect to read the whole 15 pages. But if you're in my consulting division for let's say configure price quote what's that vision look like you know i have to have something that they can see how many people are going to be there what are you going to do why are we going to be competitive at this particular product what's going to make us great and how is it going to synergize with the rest of the organization and then multiply that times everything that we offer every we're a consulting company so every different group of consultants needs to have that clarity so that they can see how is this going to impact me and by driving it down that detailed then everybody reads that part and maybe the executive summary at the top, but but there's a lot of different people who need to see their, their specific slice of the pie. So David's been talking about vision and I just wanna go ahead and say this, if you feel like you wanna upgrade your vision, I've got a tool that I've been using with clients for a long time. And if you want that tool, just send me an email to gene at genehammett.com and ask for vision tools, something to do with vision. I will respond to you. You don't have to log into anything. You don't have to do anything other than just send me an email to gene at genehammett.com. Now back to David. I agree with you. And that's one reason why I have a longer version that I think every person on the company should know where they fit in that vision. And when you break it out by teams, it really is a cool way to do that. David, you mentioned something about crisis too. Every organization has endured crisis, whether it be pandemics or shifting economies or you know, people maybe just delaying or some all of a sudden your healthy financials are no longer healthy. Um, what is your keys and leadership to get through that with your team? Yeah. So I think there's a few that I've learned uh, over time and, and, I, and I'll, a few of them I found to be contrarian. The first is having a stiff upper lip and just playing like it's okay. That might work for some people, but that doesn't work for me. Like 2008, for example, in 2008, when that we had that financial crisis in October, November of 2008, I had 100% of my customers cancel their contracts. And I was, I rolled a zero. Have you ever rolled a zero? Like I was in several years into my business at this point, and all of a sudden revenue went to zero. And, you know, what do you do when that happens? Well, I, the first thing that I did is I did have to tell everybody, hey, you know, we're rolling a zero this month. The financial crisis hit, it's outside of our control. And I think the first key for me is don't blame somebody else for something that's completely outside of everyone's control. It wasn't that somebody on my team didn't try hard enough or that the quality of our work wasn't what good enough. This was an external you know, threat and um, you know, we had to handle it as a team. So the, the first thing I did is I was extremely candid. Now, some people did panic, but ironically, them leaving and going and finding another job sort of helped us solve some of our expense issues at a time when we couldn't be fully employed. So for me, that wasn't such a bad thing. Um, but you know, I think that you know, after that, it, it all comes down to how are you going to respond, right? And I'm sure you've been there before where, you know, a crisis happens and, and you have several choices of how you respond. And for me, you know, that particular crisis was the first time that I really had to get creative and realize that I needed something to do that was outside our, our regular comfort zone. I needed to reinvent and, uh, and I did. And that's really where we, where we went from there. I think a lot of us can relate to leadership in midst of crisis. And it may not be the same as what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you make a distinction between your crisis leadership versus just day-to-day -day leadership? The, to me, crisis leadership, I have a mantra that I say over and over again all throughout the day. And that mantra is make things happen. 
make things happen. Something's got to happen. We can't be talking about a strategy or writing up a two page document unless, you know, we have a clear action plan for what that needs to be. We need to make things happen. So going back to that 2008 crisis, I, I got to tell you, I needed to make something happen. And that thing needed to be, I need to make it rain and I need to make it rain that month. And I was like, how am I going to do this when, when all 100% of my clients are gone? And for me, what I did was I called my biggest partner, Oracle, and I told him I'm done. Like I'm out. I have nothing. And I loved working with you guys, but I need something to come into the business. Is there anything out there that you guys have that you could bring me in on? And because I'd been working with them and I had a relationship, they just looked at me and were like, oh yeah, yeah, we have you know five different companies that could use some services right now. And if you give it to them on the cheap to keep going, I'm sure you'll be fine. And I had five new customers uh, within a week and um, it was hard. I mean, that's essentially begging. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves. We, I, you would call that begging when you, I, I kind of call that begging. It's begging, but I also know that you've, <laughs> you've created the relationship, you've invested long-term so that you had something to go back to. And I think a lot of people lose sight of relationships in today's world. They're, they're more short-term thinking. You partnered with a huge company that could make that happen for you. And I got to tell you, I was terrified they would just laugh at me. Like, you idiot, you lost to all of your customers in a week, but you know, the, everyone saw the same financial crisis and nobody treated me that way. Um, but I was afraid of that. And I think that the hardest part about picking up the phone was swallowing my pride and realizing that I just needed to ask for help. That was hard to do. And, um, but it saved the company at a really, really difficult time. And then we bounced back from there, but um, whew, that was it. So to me, yes, leadership comes down to in a crisis, make things happen is the is the key thing and and sooner or later that's you build the momentum and with the momentum of a creative response comes the the chance to to get back and and, and get out of the crisis you've been talking about this response thing before and and we've probably read about certain things but what is what are your real ideas around responding powerfully as a leader creativity is the number one thing, and I'll, I'll tell you a story from my personal family. When we were went into that pandemic, uh, which I know everyone's sick of pandemic stories, but just a quick one. You know, my my family was nervous, and so one thing that we did is every day we went over to the motive office, and my kids did school from the motive office from a couple of empty cubicles, and my wife and I worked from, and we're just sitting there. And I was like, "What do we do? I mean, we have an eight thousand square foot office with four people, and how can we be creative and make this better?" Right. And, and the one idea is, well, we could go buy a bunch of Nerf guns and we could have a Nerf gun battle every time there's a break. And so it is like one of my favorite memories of the pandemic is being in this empty office with Nerf guns and my kids, like taking a 15 minute break every once in a while and, and battling it out, you know, and, uh, and having a great time. That to me is the kind of creativity and response that if you're open to it, you got to be open to it. And so it's at a time when you're the most tense. But if you're open to it, you can you can do something that it's completely impossible before. And that's the opportunity you're looking for. How has this impacted the relationship you have with your employees, that employee experience? Because you wouldn't be where you are without your team. You know, the team really comes to me for the off the wall ideas. And um, and I think that's really why <laughs> where, where it happens. So, so, you know, so we've got the atomic unit of success set up, right? We have our discipline processes. We can deliver on the day to day quite effectively. And I'm not needed for any of that, but it's the curveballs, right? Those, and that's where I'd love to be is when do we get something that's so unusual, so peculiar that um, the standard playbook won't work. And, you know, being able to see the myriad opportunities there is, uh, is really the key. And I remember that that happened to me. It was a minor crisis right around 2006. And I had another entrepreneur just say that to me. He was like, there was a crisis. I was stressed out of my mind. I could, you know, a cold sweat stress. And he, he said, I don't know about you guys, man, but my spidey senses are tingling. There's something that we can do with this. And I, I looked at him and thought, wow, that's just not how I was approaching this situation. And that actually changed my mindset from that day forward um, to always look for that. So look for the opening. David, we're sitting here talking about you know, leadership in, in a crisis. What else would you add to that whole conversation to help other leaders that might be going through a crisis right now? You know, the, the, the number one thing that I do on every morning on, on the day of a crisis is I, I give myself that, that mental trick of saying, what if I had just parachuted into the body of David G. Ewing with all of his memories right at this moment? Like, none of this is my fault. I'm just here having to fight it out from this point forward. I don't know why that silly little imaginary thought makes me feel so much better, but it makes me feel like I'm starting something brand new. And every day, if you can come to something with, uh, with brand new freshness, even though you're so weary of it, you're so exhausted, 
it allows me to see new possibilities every day. And so I think if you're going through a crisis right now, that's my number one thing is pretend that this is this is your first day on the job and, and you just got handed this from someone else. And it does free you up from all of the traps and agony of the past. Once you can release the past, I think then getting creative about the way forward is the thing. And I mean, Gene, it happened to you, right? I mean, you you had a horrible, terrible experience happen and you had to recover from it, you know? And you rebuilt yourself and, and you're completely reborn as a completely new professional because of it, right? Now, I love David's question about parachuting into your body. I have a little simpler version of that. You can use either one that works for you, but act like you're a consultant to a business. You've got to be the outsider. This is the hard part. But when you're an outsider, you're not, um, attached emotionally to the way it's always been done or the people and whatnot. But what are the changes you would make as a consultant to your own business? Now, that's an exercise I've run with clients before to get them to, to try to look for things, new perspectives, and maybe even look at with fresh eyes. It's just a little bit of a tool that I've used to help clients. Hopefully it helps you too. Absolutely. I mean, I think some of the, the listeners might be new, so they don't know the story, but I, I lost everything in 2010. And I became a coach because I lost everything, which is, sounds really ridiculous. Uh, but it actually became the worst thing that ever happened, but also the best. Um, that was an inflection point for me. So I'm kind of curious for you, David, looking back over your career as a leader, what's one inflection point that you could share with, with our audience that would really help them understand where you've grown as a leader? You know, I think the, the run-up to us making the Inc. 5000 the first time was the, the biggest inflection point for me because... Uh, you know, we made the Inc. 5000 list in, in 2022 because of our performance um, between 2017 and 2022. That was the, the time period. So, you know, what happened in 2017 that really helped us make that inflection point? And it was for me as a leader, the the final let go. I, I mean, I'd not been in, I'd been in business at that point for 12 years, right? But I finally had to let go of being an individual contributor. And that was so, it's so easy to say and so hard to do. But in 2017, what I learned was that um, I really needed to own the process and not the result. And so for me, I started to attack every single thing that I could around what is our process going to be? How are we going to take something as amorphous as customer experience consulting and turn it into disciplined, repeatable, effective plays that will work in our targets. And so I had to rethink everything in 2017. I had to rethink the markets that we were going after so that I could make that uh, set us up for success. I had to rethink our entire delivery strategy. I had to rethink how we train people. I had to rethink the kinds of people we were hiring and the way that we rebuilt the organization. And, and then I had to you know turn the entire ship. And it took two years, 2017 and 2018, but you know, the results started to immediately come through. And so, you know, we cruised right on through the pandemic and everything else. But um, I feel like I was in one of the few businesses in the world that was neither helped nor hurt by it. And as a result, we were able to just run our play without that disruption. And, um, and that I think was the inflection point was it was having to let go of that, the, uh, of the result and focus on the process. And on top of all that, you have the epic uh, wars of Nerf in your side, your office to remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. David, thank you so much for being here and sharing your insights. We've been talking about uh, leadership in a crisis, and I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom. My pleasure, Gene. Thanks for having me. Fantastic interview today. Leading in a crisis is something we all are going to have to do. It's not about if, it's about when. And so my hope is that you took some notes today, that you're able to sharpen up your skills and how you're going to lead in a crisis and why you want to be able to do this effectively is apparent to me, but hopefully you know now why it's so important. Uh, our job is to help you create the kind of company you really don't want to have to sell or don't want to sell, but to create a company that's self-expanding and to create a company that where leadership is a competitive advantage and that you are driving and leading the charge from that with other people, not just you alone, but everyone. If you have any um, questions for us, just send them to me, gene at genehammer.com. When you think of growth and you think of leadership, think of Growth Think Tank. As always, leave courage. We'll see you next time.